This morning we have two speakers, both from the city of Montrose. Um, Scott Murphy, city engineer, Jim Shai, public works director. And I'll just give you, and I'm Kathy Beavers. I keep forgetting to introduce who I am. Um, Scott is a registered professional engineer specializing in municipal infrastructure design, geotechnical analysis and design, and construction project management. He has a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Engineering degrees in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Utah State University before coming to the city of Montrose in 2013, he worked as a consulting project engineer in Salt Lake City, Utah. As city engineer, he's responsible for managing the design, construction, and inspection of all of the city's large-scale capital projects and plan review and inspection of infrastructure-related elements associated with subdivisions and site developments for our city. Jim Scheid, the public works director, grew up in Montrose, graduated from Montrose High School. I remember having Jim in class. <laughs> 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 He was a good student. <laughs> he um, attended CSU and graduated with a degree, a bachelor's degree in construction management. While going to school, Jim worked as a carpenter and field superintendent on several projects throughout Colorado. After graduating, he worked for FCI Constructors on projects in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and North Dakota. In an attempt to get closer to home, Jim and his wife Kelly moved to Cheyenne, and Jim worked as a fabricator for, is it Noble, Casing? And within a couple of years, he was the district manager of all of the Cheyenne operations. He then worked as project manager in custom residential construction and commercial structural steel before working for the city of Montrose. What I've heard about these two almost since they arrived on the scene is what talented individuals they each are and how lucky we are to have them um, managing all of these things for the city of Montrose. I, in the email I sent out, I almost wanted to call them the dynamic duo, because um, that's, that's really the reputation that they have. While we've been sitting at home during um, COVID, these guys have not been sitting at home and they have a lot to tell you about 2020, what's happening in 2021, and what we can look forward to for 2022. So I think Jim is starting, and we'll turn the mic over to him. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. As Kathy said, I'm Jim Scheid, our public works manager, um, which means I manage several divisions, um, parks, streets, fleet, facilities, um, I'm missing one, trash recycle, um, and, the, and capital projects in the vertical sense. So me and Scott kind of split up capital project management, and um, I, I kind of take care of the vertical, which means like a, a building or a structure, and Scott is more on the horizontal side, which would be, you know, utility infrastructure, street infrastructure, and drainage. Um, so anyway, today we'll talk about capital projects and what we've been working on and what we are working on now. Um, to start off, in 2020, some of the big projects that are going on currently, we were in the design phase for. So um, like the um, new police department project here on South First, that's one that 
a lot of work was done in 2020, um, but you couldn't see it. It was a lot of team team development and design work. So we hired our uh, technical advisor, we hired an owner's rep, um, our design team and uh, engineering staff, and, and as well as our CMGC. So all those were hired and our design was substantially complete in 2020. And we'll get to that project later on in the presentation and kind of show where it's at now. But 2020 was a big year for that project, but just not in anything that you can physically see in the ground. But speaking of what you can see in the ground, um, <coughs> some of the projects we've done in-house, this was city crews, um, capital projects, smaller scale stuff, but this is what we, some of the stuff we were working on last year. Um, so that top picture there is a culvert replacement out at our, near the animal services building, um, where the wastewater treatment plant is at. Um, this was a, a failing uh, culvert, and we replaced that in-house. Um, it actually was a difficult project because that is the only access to the animal services building or the wastewater treatment plant. So we really couldn't just remove it and take our time in replacing it. It was um, a very coordinated effort to get that put back in and keep that road open. Um, and we did actually two of those. That's a, it's a, they were both large and the same size as this one, uh, this crossing, and then also one north of here. Um, the lower picture is an access road to the amphitheater site, and I'll talk about that project later also. Um, but we did this portion of the project in-house last year um, for a few reasons. So this is, um, this picture is taken right near the Cerise parking lot um, at the dog park. And so you're looking kind of towards the south right here. And what this is for is access to the amphitheater site. And we did it, one, for just cost savings reasons that we can do it in-house with our own equipment and do it cheaper than we would have paid a contractor but also it gave that project a little bit of a head start. So the amphitheater project, one of the constraints in that is actually the um, getting the turf established on the, the seating area. And to be able to do that um, by the time the project was complete, one of the, the biggest critical factors in their schedule was the turf. And if they, um, by the time we were able to give them a notice to proceed, it was early this year, I think it was March 1st, um, if we had waited that long and not had this road completed, they may not have been able to get that turf installed this year. So um, by having this road done last year, um, allowed the construction crew that's starting this year to begin immediately on the site of the amphitheater and on the building, um, which again, just kind of accelerated their schedule and lowered the cost for us. So um, it was kind of a, a twofer on that one. We were able to lower the cost and get um, the schedule to work out where the amphitheater will be um, completed, including the turf this year. A um, couple more in-house projects. Um, our parks, um, parks crews we're working on um, a pump track. That's the top picture there. That's, that's also on the uh, far south end of Cerise Park. Um, there was an existing pump track there, um, but this one was um, basically just built over it and, and made it much larger, added a lot of features to it, um, and just added to that area um, and all of the bike features around this area. So um, one exciting thing about that is we are continuing that work this year. Um, right now we're in a design phase of um, more bike features added in this area. Um, and actually we don't have a, a complete scope on that yet. We're kind of uh, reaching out to community members, including Katmova and Maba and the mountain bike team at the high school to try to get their input as to what would be best added to this area this year. Um, so if you're interested, let me know and I can connect you with the, uh, with our design team on improvements around this, this year. Um, and then the, the other picture there is a uh, solar light. It's uh, kind of a, a new thing we're trying to some of our trails throughout town. Um, a lot of our older um, traditional style lights have been having a lot of issues as far as keeping them on. And it's um, it's a lot of times related to underground electrical infrastructure and kind of being broken and full of water and um, having electric service throughout parks is problematic. So um, utilizing a solar light for trail lighting 
and something we were just trying the last couple of years, and it's working really well. I think uh, we are we will probably continue to add, and, and as we're replacing lights, they'll get replaced with a solar light, at least for our trail system. Um, they, they're working really well. Okay, on to this year. So 2021, these are items we're working on now. Um, this is an improvement at La Raza Park, um, the northwest side of town. Um, so we are added or replacing the basketball court. So there was one there, it was very broken. Um, it was des desperately needing repaired. So it was removed, replaced with a new concrete pad. There will be a um, sports court surfacing applied to that. Um, painted, of course, to um, have a basketball layout on it. New hoops, new benches, and these same solar lights I was just talking about will be added to this area as well. Um, so just a another small improvement to um, one of our parks, and, de and desperately needed. This one was uh, in very bad shape. So um, they're um, they're substantially complete now. They have the concrete and the hoops uh, in. Um, some of the items, like the benches and the lights, are pretty long, neat time items, so they're uh, um, about a month from being complete with this project, but it actually looks like something now. And the amphitheater. Um, so this um, is all where I was talking about that access road down near Cerise Park. So um, actually, I'll go to the site plan and I explain this. Um, so the access road I was talking about comes off right here. This is the dog park right here. This is the parking area. And then so that access road comes in around here and to the back side of the amphitheater. And this is what we built last year. And what the construction crew is working on now is the building itself and then the this surrounding site and utilities. Um, and they are also um, doing very well. They're, um, if you've been out there, the masonry walls are up, so it actually looks like a real structure. Um, steel should be going up in the next couple of weeks, which also will be pretty impressive. Once that's up, it'll look uh, very large. Um, so it's kind of off the side of the field. So right here is a, um, the trail that surrounds the fields, and then it drops off into the amphitheater. So this is all lower than the fields and um, doesn't replace or damage any of them. stats on the building it's about 8,000 square feet the site itself is about four acres and seating capacity in this turf area here um, which I've described as kind of a full but comfortable event could seat up to 5,000 people On to the Montrose Public Safety Complex. That's the large new police department that we're building on South First. This is one I was talking about in 2020. We had a lot of design work and a lot of um, procurement of our team. Um, 
this this one uh, definitely ta it's taken a lot of time. You know, it's been a lot of work in even getting us to this point. We have started construction now, um, and that uh, and they're moving along very well. But it, uh, a project of this size takes a lot of um, work and a lot of free time work. <coughs> So as you can see on this, there's um, this room right here is the community room. And so it kind of sticks out from the front of the building, very prominent, um, all glass. So it'll be kind of lit up and, and easily identified. This is where uh, this area of the building is open to the community and to be used for um, meetings, events, um, many things. So the area of the building is open to the public all the time. And then of course the main entrance right next to it. And this main entrance is um, almost directly across the street from the City Hall main entrance. So City Hall and this building um, kind of mirror each other. A lot of the design features and the arches and the, um, the stone used was a lot to resemble um, the styles used in City Hall and, and to, um, in a way, reflect it across the street. Um, and this is our site plan, and uh, this may be what you've seen. We've issued this in press releases several times. It's out on social media. Um, this is kind of just communicating the site with the public and what, what it's going to look like throughout construction. So, um, again, this is City Hall right here. First Street goes right through here, and it's closed through construction. So they will use it as kind of their primary delivery route where they would drop off all their materials. But um, right now, it's completely dug up and removed. There's, there is no access. And throughout construction, it'll remain closed. Um, you can see the existing building right here. This is the existing PD. And then the new building will be built pretty much around it on three sides. Um, this building being two stories. Um, this building being a single story, but um, high ceiling type. And then that community room I mentioned is right out here out front. And they would have um, secure parking um, in the rear of the building. And so that um, green line around that site basically shows the entire uh, <coughs> site for the uh, public safety complex. And this is what it looks like right now. So, um, this is actually what I think is probably one of the most interesting phases of construction um, because everything they're building now, you will never see again. So they are uh, <coughs> drilling the pile, the helical piles. There's 240 piles installed for the foundation. Um, they're putting on pile caps and rate beams and when they cover that with concrete, it'll never be seen again. Um, the large um, structure there in the middle, that um, is the stair tower. Um, it's actually one of the um, biggest components of the structure of the building, so everything is kind of tied back to this big anchor of the building, I like to call it. Uh, a lot of concrete, a lot of rebar, um, and again, one of the biggest features in the building. It goes to the, to the roof level of the building, but everything is tied back to there. There'll be a second one. This is the stair tower, and then right here, there's an elevator shaft, which will look very similar to it. Um, and between those two, that is the, uh, the main structural component of the whole building. Um, and again, just an interesting phase in that everything being put in now is very, um, a lot of underground utilities um, between um, water, power, fiber, all of that is being installed now, um, including the overhead utilities. So you can see this overhead line right here that goes down the alleyway. Um, several different providers along those utility poles and all of that will be undergrounded um, through the whole block from Cascade down to Padre will be underground. Um, which, honestly, that's a project in itself. Um, between all of the different power and fiber and um, cable utilities along that line or along those poles, that is um, quite the project just to get it undergrounded. And we're doing that now. So here in the next couple of months, that those lines will come off those poles and they'll be removed. Um, one other thing about this stage of construction and, and why I like it is, um, you know, a lot of things we're finding underground are unknown. So there's a lot of unknown conditions and 
it requires you know a creative approach to coming up with a good solution to some of those problems that um, whether it be groundwater or just soil conditions things like that that um, you really can't anticipate and as you start digging a site this large um, having to come up with solutions that are cost effective and, and schedule effective is um, challenging and so it's, those are kind of the um, what I think of as the fun areas of construction um, so with that I'll hand it out to Scott Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm very excited to be back in person and talking about our projects here. Um, so, like Jim's, I'll start with some of the stuff we did in 2020, just because I think the last time we talked was 2019, if I remember right. It's been a while. Um, for us, when COVID hit, um, we had two or three days where everyone just kind of, you know, when they had the, the state mandates to shut down everything, um, everyone was kind of confused, and we had two or three days, and then all our contractors said, oh, we got our exemptions. We're going to go back to work and so because of those you know i think the state had this critical infrastructure exemptions uh, most of them worked under that um, we were able to work safely with them we, you know, most of our work by nature is outside so um, worked out pretty well and uh, really our projects outside of they they kept going they just became harder because everything we needed to buy is now impossible to buy and that's still going on um hopes that gets fixed soon because um, it adds some challenges for projects but uh um, so starting with uh, some of the stuff we did wrap up, uh, this one was kind of three quarters done when, when COVID hit. Uh, this is a river bottom drive reconstruction. This was a good um, partnership project. I saw Mary somewhere, thanks to the rec district. Um, big partner on this one, uh, some money from DOLA. Um, you know, I always talk about these as like the, the teamwork project, except everybody does the work. Um, so like in school when one person did the work. Um, so this was good partnership. Uh, you know, here's Holly Park on the right. Uh, they kind of took care of that, and a por portion of the Dola Grant took care of theirs, and then we took care of the road itself. Um, got parking, sidewalks, trees, um, got that ditch piped. Um, I love products like this because, as you can see on the left, the bar was very low to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> Nowhere to go but up. Um, and then this is the Connect Trail. So uh, this started about a year and a half prior. We had uh, got a little slow with the contract a little bit uh, towards the end of 20, let's see what year was that? I have no sense of time, 2019. Um, and uh, had to finish the underpass in 2020. So the project as a whole was mostly done in 2019, but um, had to finish this underpass at West Main um, going into 2020 to do a, a specialty shot creek wall here. Um, technology out smart. Um, so I like the before and after. So this is before. This is the same kind of taken from the same vantage, you know, the same girders uh, here. Um, had to, this was this was my favorite shop local slide because we had um, Western Gravel Constructors, uh, which is a local contractor, TEI Rock Drills, a local manufacturer of um, specialty underpinning and drilling equipment. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, the contractor, the, anyway, the, the drilling contractor is also local. Um, so really unique stuff that usually you have to go somewhere else for, um, was able to get done uh, all with local talent. Um, and then after the product was done, we, we went out our, in cooperation with our DART um, team, went out, uh, did a request for artists to do this mural. And so if you haven't seen it, uh, swing by and check it out. Pretty awesome mural there on the underpass at West Main. Here's some more before and after pictures. Uh, I'm going to show a lot of these because I think this is one of the coolest projects we've ever done. Um, prettier than, not prettier than my wife, but pretty. It's, it's up there. <laughs> Gotta be careful what I say. Uh, this is the underpass uh, right by City Market. So the, the trail added two and a quarter miles to the overall system. Um, another partnership, you know, uh, Colorado Outdoors, David Dregu, they donated 47 acres of land uh, that made the northern stretch of this trail possible. Um, Two million dollars from GoCo. Rec District was another partner on this one, um, among five or six other agencies that helped contribute to make this product a reality. So, you know, about two point—I can't remember the number. Two point eight million or so. Uh, two million. Oh, almost two point four million was from outside partners. So, 
I would say in the big picture, darn near free um, that we got this project for and really um, focused on getting underneath the two biggest roads in our, or busiest roads in our town, um, West Main and Townsend Avenue, getting the population centers connected to the recreation centers, which are down in our parks. Um, this, that's when we have city market in the background there. Um, this is the underpass there, which now, or which gave us connectivity to the rec center also, um, into this larger trail network. Um, so, really cool project. Um, pretty excited for that one. Uh, not as cool looking project, but equally as fun, uh, was the replacement of our outlet works up at Cerro Reservoir. Um, so the city has a 700 acre foot reservoir at the top of Cerro Summit, um, filled off of water that comes from the Cimarron Canal Company. Um, we hold shares in that company that acts as a backup supply. So should, primarily our drinking water comes from our rights are in Ridgeway, um, but our water comes from Blue Mesa via water exchanges. Uh, the water comes through the Gunnison Tunnel um, into the Product 7 treatment plant. Um, should they ever need to shut down the tunnel for maintenance, or if there were, you know, God forbid it was a collapse or an issue with the tunnel, this is where we would go to try and um, maintain drinking water while they address that. Um, so the system has a pipe that goes all the way down Cerro, or down, um, down the highway down to the treatment plant. Built in 1922, um, under a land grant from Taft to the city of Montrose, um, was in pretty rough shape um, and, and had really no choice but to completely rebuild and rehabilitate the outlet works on it, um, for primarily for safety reasons. Um, uh, you know, uh, the pipe was old, a lot of it was old cast iron in pretty rough shape, but also undersized. And so there's a lot of modern dam safety regulations as population increase downstream of the dam risks go up because consequences go higher, hit, hit, hit a threshold where the state requires that um, the outlet works be replaced. So this excavation is about 85 feet deep. This is the top of the dam here. Um, had no way but to just cut, get all the way down to replace the pipe at the bottom. Um, that product took about two years to complete um, and it's slow to fill because we only have so many rights off of the off of the ditch and you can only fill it so fast. But um, we are proud to report that it's about 10 feet from the top now. So hopefully we'll be close to topping it off this spring. If not, she'll be full this fall, hopefully. So, and they stocked it with cutthroat trap. And it's open for fishing again. So enjoy the fish. And they're catching. They're not big, but they're catching. <laughs> um, another product that was going underway was about three quarters done when COVID hit was uh, a replacement of a bridge deck on 6530 Road. Uh, so this old one here, you can see all these cracks. Those are primarily because the deck wasn't stiff enough, and so every, it was aged, but also built um, to a, a lower standard. Um, you know, every time a car would go over to flex, and that's why you see all this, this scratch in here. So I uh, replaced it with a modern uh, reinforced concrete bridge deck uh, with asphalt on top. And I uh, was able to wrap that one up pretty easily um, as COVID hit. Um, I think that's it for the big ones for 2020. Uh, and I'll, I'm breezing over this pretty quick. We could probably talk about any of these for hours, but uh, we do have time at the end for questions. So um, if I'm going too fast, I apologize. And uh, I always remind myself to enunciate before I do these things. So if I'm mumbling, I also apologize. Um, coming into 2021, this was a, a rehabilitation project on the uh, Pottery River. Uh, this started at about North 9th Street, which is down here at the bottom. Extended north, kind of through a couple of oxbow areas in the uh, river, and then we also had a stabilization project here. Um, I don't have the picture with me, but you know, in June 2019, um, when we had those really large flows, um, the river kind of beat us to it for an area that we were going to stabilize anyway um, and try to take it out for us. It was moving on the order of five feet a day, five to ten feet a day. It was, it was pretty wild, but. Uh, um, but independent of that, this project was primarily focused on ecological restoration of the river. Um, it's part of the URA's overall master plan uh, that this would get donated to the city. So this is part of the 47 acre track that the Dragoos and Colorado Outdoors dedicated to the city, um, which has facilitated the public rec trail. And now this is all open to public fishing um, and stabilized and created a, a more natural system with flood, flood, floodplain connections, riparian habitat, um, obviously fish habitat, things of that sort. Um, so this was another partnership project. Uh, got about $500,000 from the Colorado Water Conservation Board, 300 and some thousand from um, uh, CPW for their Fishing is Fun program. And then the balance was part of the URA's uh, tax increment financing, which are loans that are repaid by 
um, uh, property taxes that would have, as the incremental property taxes go up. Um, we have a whole presentation on the URA at some point this summer, so I won't go too deep into the URA stuff. Um, outside of this project was um, good success, completed on time, under budget. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, this was a fun one. It's not very fun we get to go, or not very often we get to go to tour around in a river. So. Um, another project within the URA, uh, so I don't know if anyone's heard, but we have a housing problem. <laughs> and uh, uh, part of that is, you know, the cities, there's you know, kind of different niches of housing. There's obviously, uh, you know, the higher end housing, there are a lot of retirees with, um, you know, equity are coming in and building. Um, we don't usually get too involved in that, um, but this between workforce housing, which is, you know, typical market rate housing for typical, you know, kind of workers, worker level, you know, firemen, nurses, things of that sort. Um, that's kind of where the city kind of plays in that arena. And then there's the affordable housing arena, which is what you see as a lot of the CHAPA projects, um, subsidized housing, things of that sort. Those, for the most part, kind of handled more on the state level. But um, the city's trying to help facilitate um, getting some of that workforce housing niche. Because I don't know if, you know, any employers in this room have had this problem. We've had this problem where people show up, we are trying to hire people, and they turn around and go back where they came from because they can't find a house, um, which is, uh, you know, has consequences for our community. Um, so one of the ones that's going, Kind of a, we like two furs and three furs. This one's at least a two fur. Um, it's helping kind of facilitate Colorado outdoors as well, but um, uh, also addressing the housing problem is these base camp apartments. Um, base camp is the name of the subdivision. Uh, this is 96 units coming online at the southern end of the URA. So this is south of 9th Street um, between Grand Avenue and the river. Um, and then the way the city has helped facilitate this project is um, we're helping with some of the infrastructure extensions from 9th Street. Um, so if, You've driven by, you've seen big stacks of pipe out there on that project is underway. The city will be, um, under our project, constructing uh, water, sewer, utilities down to this site, and then they're taking care of the um, site itself. Um, URA is a partner on the uh, <coughs> parking lot of this site. Um, that's a separate uh, deal from the city. Another project going on in 21 is the Woodgate realignment. Um, so, if anybody's ever driven this stretch of Woodgate between East Oak Grove and Old Woodgate knows how fun that is. A lot of crisscrossing. And what you have is, you know, the, the city really needs good north-south connectivity outside of Townsend. Um, right now, everything kind of funnels to Townsend. It's pretty problematic. We're up to like 27,000 vehicles a day on South Townsend now. Um, and only growing, you know, Montre with this pandemic, Montreux has become even cooler. and. Uh, a lot more people are coming, so we're seeing pretty drastic upticks in traffic. So, you know, overall, try and stay ahead of that growth. You know, they have the South Hillcrest extension, the rehabs and the roundabouts on Hillcrest that have helped kind of pave the ground for this is kind of the next step to um, get an alternate to Townsend on the east side, um, kind of in that first urban core. You know, I kind of think of it as rain. So you got Hillcrest will be the first, 6700 will be the next. Um, on the west side, you have Grand, Rio Grande that kind of serves as your, as your alternate. Um, ideally, you know, when the Hillcrest came down, it would have gone straight through all the way to Ogden. Fortunately, there's a neighborhood in the way. Um, so the cars we were dealt, this is kind of the next best thing we can do um, for that traffic is, you know, as they come down Hillcrest over here off the page, um, come over and get through this way. Um, long term, as, as development pressure increases, you can see more traffic on East Oak Road. This will require a roundabout at some point. Um, ideally, at that point, this road would be connecting north and also give a way out for um, Encanto, I think, and Church Lane or something up there behind Murdoch's. Um, that area is about impossible to get out. Um, so that would be a future kind of phase of this project. Right now we're bringing it through as a T. Um, we've been working on, this is all private land. Um, so we've been working on the land acquisitions through here for about a year um, in 2020 uh, to get to that. And that was, that was a big win for us. We've kind of been, uh, they've tried in the past and were unsuccessful. Um, we actually came to a really great, mutually beneficial deal um, uh, for this project with this developer, this go around, um, and wanted to get this in and get this first phase done because the roundabout kind of becomes easy at that point um, in the future. So the old Woodgate, where it used to go out, will be closed. Uh, the primary access will be here. Um, so tr some traffic will redistribute to the lights down here. Um, this will become important in probably five or six years and also improving the capacity of this intersection because um, this is a pretty limiting intersection also. So, uh, you know, step one of five, like any of these big projects, 
um, but it does set us up that we have a long-term solution. If, if you run the models and put the traffic growth on all these streets and leave this as is, um, it gets to gridlock within about 10 years. And so, not that there won't be any less traffic down here, the traffic will still be um, very heavy, but it sets us up to be able to accommodate that in the long term and actually have a, a successful solution in this area, which is pretty challenging on space. Uh, there are two houses down here. Uh, Vogue's, another shop local thing, uh, Vogue's house moving is able to move those out. Um, it's currently in the process, so if you swing by, or if you're in the neighborhood, be sure to swing by because it's not every day you can watch a house driving down the road. Um, here's a picture of construction, so you can see the initial, this is looking south from Oak Grove. Um, you can see the initial cut here and how that will connect back to uh, right by the car wash there. Um, and here's the water tank. I don't know if you guys have seen this or not. <laughs> um, this is a 130 foot tall standpipe up on Sunset Mesa. Um, right now, there's an existing underground tank that was built in the 1960s, kind of for the original town. Um, so back in the 1960s, the town was a lot smaller, demands were a lot smaller, regulations were a lot different. And that worked for the 1960s um, as developments occurred, especially on the west side of the river. So this is situated on the west side of the Empire River, and I'll come back to that. But um, as the system has changed, population demands have changed, that's kind of become defunct and no longer works. Uh, the old tank was actually out of service about six years ago or so. Um, the system, this pressure, so this is kind of unique, so everyone asks, why is this so tall? Um, if you were to take a hose and hook it into the bottom of this tank and just let it fill, it would fill to the top of this tank by, on its own. No pumps, no anything. So our, our system runs, with the exception of one small zone out by East Oak Grove, 100% on gravity. And that's just the beauty of the treatment plant is up by, you know, on the way to Black Canyon. Um, and is able to put enough head on the system to, to keep the whole system running by gravity. So this, actually, this system 100% floats on the gravity of, of the water system. And what that does for us, so um, there's a couple um, lines that run across the river. Uh, if those were to ever be severed, if there's ever a major, major disruption in service or power outage, this can supply uh, development towards the west. So think of Cobble Creek, Waterfall Canyon, some of those larger city developments that are continuing to grow. Um, this stabilizes the pressures and provides redundant supply to all of those um, essentially passively. Um, the below ground solution is doable, probably would have had to take up this um, soccer field, uh, and then you're still having to pump. And so any, every bit you go down, you have to pump to make up that difference. And over the life of you know, like a 50 year tank, that's millions and millions and millions of dollars in electricity and pumping costs. So you're burning electricity to bring into the tank and then just pumping it downhill to put it back. Um, and so did a pretty detailed alternatives evaluation. This one kind of rose to the top. Um, and uh, through that process, the public process didn't get a lot of feedback. Um, we're getting some feedback now that people can see it, as you can imagine. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, that is the logic behind it. It's kind of geared towards keeping us resilient and safe. And another piece of this is, is water quality. So you know, those submerged tanks, having to pump out of them, the hydraulics of the system are such that getting that water out is pretty difficult. And so this facil facilitates the ability to run water through continually, um, so you always have a fresh supply of water. That the old tank, um, it's pretty structurally defunct, but was also taken offline because of water quality purposes. Because um, that water became so stagnant, it started to become a risk for um, bacteriological reasons. Back in yeah six or seven years ago, that that has been offline and stayed offline. Um, there is a small booster pump, but that's only for water in the Sunset Mesa ball fields. So I'm going to ask to supplement and have about 10 psi or so. so. Um, sorry if I bored all you guys with hydraulics, but I get excited about this stuff. Um, and then coming into some of the bigger street maintenance stuff, so we usually have a forum presentation every couple of years on street maintenance itself. So this is focused on how and why and how things are prioritized and the split between city crews and hired crews and stuff. So we won't go into that again. I'll just touch quickly on uh, some of the contracted street work that uh, we do. So. You know, Jim will take care of a lot of the in-house operational street maintenance stuff. Um, we work with them to look at what areas to hit, and then we manage a contracted project. So this year we're doing a million bucks on uh, patching. You guys have probably seen some of the stuff on Woodgate, Ogden, Nodell. Um, slide blue areas are, are areas focused on patching and fixing some of the uh, failed pavement in some of these areas. And then, you know, there's 
road maintenance is difficult. Prioritizing when we use asset management software that tells us you know where your best bang for your buck is and where to hit things as they come off the degradation curve. And that's great and dandy to spend a lot of money on the on the good roads to keep the good roads good, but the reality is we have some that have failed, so we need to find a good split between fixing the old and keeping the good good because it's it's cheap. It's like the analogy is it's cheaper to paint your house and replace your siding. And so trying to strike that balance. Um, so that's what drove some of this up here is surface treatments. Uh, I, it's a um, slurry seal, which is kind of a black thick veneer, kind of a step up from a chip seal because um, nobody likes chip seals. And, uh, and then you'll see some patching work going on out here. Some other projects in 2021. Um, the, uh, for anybody that lives south, down in the Woodgate area, south of let's see, Otter Road on Woodgate, um, we've been doing a complete rehab of a sewer project down there. That one's wrapped up. That was a unique uh, cured-in-place lining system. Uh, we're able to pipe burst some lines where you run through the old line, um, break the line apart, and pull in a new one behind it, um, and also do UV-cured um, liners uh, to a rehab a system that was kind of inherited by the city after a lagoon failed uh, back in, I think, the 70s or so. Again, I get numbers crossed a lot, so. Um, did a sidewalk extension on North 9th, which was kind of a compliment to the La Raza Park improvements, trying to improve connectivity between there and uh, the new rec trail. Uh, this is a pretty big project here, this number three. Um, so CDOT, I don't know if everybody here from CDOT, but uh, thank you CDOT. Uh, we, they have an overlay plan for Townsend in 2022. Um, they might break it up into two years. It's, it's not sure yet exactly how it'll go down, but um, they are looking to, a couple projects they have in the pipeline is a redo of the intersection of San Juan and Townsend, um, up by the New Maverick there with a double dual left. Anybody who's been in that southbound queue, it's pretty horrendous. Um, so that project, but then also tailing on the end of that and re-milling and overlaying all of Townsend Avenue all the way down to um, I think it's to I think it's the south end of River Lane, if I remember right. I may be fuzzy on the exact stop point, but nonetheless, a complete mill and overlay of Townsend Avenue, which will be an awesome uptick for our community. So that's not, that's state dollars going in and not even managed by the city, that's managed fully by CDOT. Um, will really uplift not only, you know, for the ride and potholes, but um, the aesthetics of, of Townsend Avenue. So we're very excited for that project. Um, to try and get ahead of that, we have some old um, AC water lines and a lot of the sewer um, uh, manholes have settled. Anybody who's driven and gotten jarred by a, a low manhole lid. Um, so we're looking to go through ahead of that project and rehab all of that so that, you know, where Murphy's Law is, they'd overlay it in the pipe would break a day later. We'd have to take it up. So trying to avoid that sort of thing. Um, Birch Street bridge replacement, so there's a bridge that goes kind of to a cul-de-sac behind the golf course on Birch Street, um, has reached the end of its life. That would start once the irrigation water goes off for the year. Um, working with the county, thanks Keith. Um, thanks to our elected officials who worked out the IGA. Um, this is a partnership project between the city and the county to add a signal at US 550 in Chapita, so this is you know, south of River Landing. Uh, that product will go to construct, or is going through design now uh, through 21 and then we'll go into construction in 22. Then I found this really cool picture of our public workshop. So we're not going to construction yet, but we're starting the design process for uh, kind of a new public works campus. Um, so this is a picture from the original public workshop, which it looks pretty much the exact same. Um, in 1960, this is the San Juan bypass, uh, which is pretty cool. So I mean, it just tells you how much has changed since this facility was originally built. Um, it has very much reached the end of its life, and so we're excited to um, work towards you know, the eventual replacement. It's nothing. The, the construction and funding will take a while to, to get there, but get the plan together first. And this is one of my favorite maps to talk about. This is 2022. It's depressing, but exciting. Call them opportunities. This is 2022 and beyond. Um, this same, you know, it's probably impossible to read. Uh, I can get you copies, uh, if you email me, I can send it to you, but um, this is projects, kind of all projects we have in the hopper. So this is stuff that we're aware of is kind of imminent or, or coming, you know, either by, you know, just age or development pressures, traffic pressures, traffic patterns changing, things of this sort. It's 80 plus million dollars of projects. Um, and for anybody who's attended the previous forum uh, presentation, this about doubled 
<laughs> in in two years. Um, and what's what's happening? We're seeing a very real, I don't want to say explosion in growth, but uh, very strong interest in Montrose. Um, you know, we're exceeding anything I've ever seen in my eight years here as far as interest in people coming and looking to come to Montrose. You know, good, bad, or different, we're trying to do it right and stay ahead of it and keep the infrastructure and people moving. Um, so because of that, you know, a lot of these products that were maybe a little more longer range are, are, are coming up a little sooner. No, I'm do that. You're fine. Okay. Um, so places will probably go in 22. So this is uh, city's budgets are adopted on a year by year basis uh, by council. Um, so, you know, this is all subject to council approval, but where we, where we think we're going, you know, we're seeing some development pressure out here um, starting to hit. Um, so you'll probably see the next extension of Hill Street here up to Sunnyside. Uh, we really want to work on these north-south alternate routes. So the next kind of big piece on that is the 6700 extension. Um, so that you come off, you know, people are going to get routed that way. And as they come down, then you probably take Oak Grove over to, to Hillcrest and then down through this new Woodgate realignment. Um, but the immediate need is trying to get through the property acquisition um, to get uh, 6700 extension on the radar. So 22, we probably look at design and acquisition. There is one piece of property we need to uh, work out with landowner to get purchased for that. Um, the pr pressures are building here at the Niagara and Hillcrest roundabout. Um, so that's uh, that's going to require some property acquisition. Those things usually take six to eight months. Um, and so the idea is to get through design um, and property acquisition for that in 22, so that we go to construction ideally in 23. Um, I hit on the uh, Townsend and East Oak Grove intersection. Anybody who's kind of driven to that offset, you have a straight and a left offset from a, I think, left turn lane or something. It's, it's not fun to navigate that intersection. Um, so looking to get additional properties so we can align the lanes and get enough turn lanes here to keep this efficiency. Um, and then working on the extension of Rio Grande. So right now Rio Grande turns by the old Stovers. Um, look to get through design and property acquisition in a perfect world um, to connect that down. If you notice down at Target, um, the road is called Rio Grande, and that's because um, this was long range envisioned to um, connect down. You know, that might include an extension of Ogden so that you now have alternate ways out and take some of the pressures off of this intersection as well. Um, and funds allow also looking to a rehab of North Park, which is in pretty rough shape. Um, the nice, you know, the good thing about this, the, the bad thing about this list is it's daunting and there's, we could do any of them today. The good part is we can't go wrong. You know, <laughs> any one of these projects would be a great benefit to our community. Um, so the, the challenge is finding out which ones are the best bang for our buck um, and really help us stay ahead of, of a lot of these pressures we're seeing. Um, we do have this Chiquita signal down here too, which is also slated to go to construction next year. So I think with that, we're happy to answer any questions. The way we're going to do questions, if you're new, so that everyone can hear your question, if you would raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic by, and then ask the question in the mic, so these guys don't have to worry about repeating the question, and everybody can hear. And we'll start with you. <coughs> Several uh, years ago, there was a plan, I thought, to uh, expand Woodgate Road to widen it and extend it to the county line. With the realignment now of Woodgate uh, and East Oak Grove, the traffic will probably increase on that road. What are the plans to handle Woodgate all the way south to even uh, Racine Road, which includes the county, of course? Yeah, so you'll see on this one has the, uh, that product is on here, um, that extension. So volume wise, we expect right now Woodgate's I think about 3,000 vehicles a day. With the realignment, that's likely to go up to probably six or 7,000 vehicles a day. Still within capacity, um, but pressure points that'll build there will ultimately be uh, probably the Odell and Woodgate intersection. Um, that'll likely become a roundabout. Uh, creates a lot of pressures on Otter Road because what a lot of people are doing is, is you know, they're southbound, they're looking to just get as far south as possible before they kick back out onto the highway. Um, so, the, I mean, in the realistic future, funding-wise, I think the farthest we go with a whole scale, you know, full 80-foot template is likely to be um, Otter Road down here um, and kick people out that way. 
you know, long term, they are all classified as minor arterials. Long term, we'd like to get down there. It's just going to come down to funding ultimately, um, how far we get. The um, city shops, right at the uh, end of the run, the beginning of the runway, is that going to need to be moved uh, from there, or from for safety reasons, and also for uh, getting more space? So the we. So we're, that's what we're working through on the design, is making sure that the existing facility does have enough space. Um, preliminary indications are it does. Um, the, there is an easement, so there's a, a clear zone easement that comes across off the tail end of the runway that has an incline to it. So it's got a, um, you know, it's, it's not a, you can't build within here, you just have to stay under this plane of the approach of the runway. Um, so that'll be taken into consideration the design. I think what we most likely see because of that and because of sequencing is that the shop may be situated further west away from the runway, and that may become more utility areas. Um, the idea of the whole thing is to kind of get it, get get a nice public entrance, so you have public and private separate, because right now, you know, there's everything to overlap, and it's a free-for-all. Um, get it as safe as possible, obviously, away from the, uh, the runway, um, and then get it kind of set back so you don't have this, uh, you know, all these operational things um, right in the front and center that are ugly, you know, kind of get building set off to the side and get landscaping around it and, and hide some of those, you know, material stockpiles and things of that sort. So some of those aircraft come in at under 100 feet right over that building. I'm sure you put that. Yeah, yep. And we, it, they're in our <laughs> design, the airport is one of the primary stakeholders, FAA, and that easement was included directly with the, um, right with the RFP, so it's, it's clear right off the bat for our designers. A question for Jim. Did I understand you to say that South First will eventually be open again from Park to the post office? Yes. So as part of this project, um, um, so right where that arrow is at, so it's close to construction, but where this arrow is, that is outside of the project scope. So the new building will kind of bump out into what is now first street but only on the south side and the north half of the street would reopen as a one-way street going west with parking stalls on it as it just as it was pre-construction and that's that's the extent of this project um you know there's discussions of using that as a plaza area in the future. None of that's planned right now, but connecting it with the existing Centennial Plaza um, as a pedestrian space, I think that's um, you know, been discussed as a, as a potential future project, but not at this time. I have a question about water. We enjoy some of the best water in the world. I'm just wondering if we can maintain that. Yeah, well, it, one of, another one of my job descriptions. Yeah, so I, I manage water resources for the city. So right now we're sitting good. Um, so we, we plan and manage for, you know, when are we going to hit the end of the end of our rope as far as water availability. Um, our water comes out of, our rights are held as part of the Dallas Divide Project and Ridgeway Reservoir. Um, we do a water right exchange with the uh, uh, Uncompahgre Valley water users so they can take water out of Ridgeway because it's higher gradient. And then they give us water out of Blue Mesa. Um, so right now we have 10,000 acre feet available for the city, which gives us some of the previous predictions up to 60,000 population. I think with, you know, as it's getting more and more arid, we're seeing increased water use. I think that number might be a little lower, um, but still pretty far off from where where we are now. Um, so for the foreseeable future, we're sitting good water rights wise um, and ability to treat wise. Uh, the um, other thing we have working for us. Um, is Ridgeway Reservoir is a relatively small reservoir relative to the size of its basin. Um, so it can fill relatively easily. I think this year it's projected to fill 15 feet, be 15 feet shy of, of filling, um, but still enough to provide all of all the various um, pools that are allocated out of that reservoir as far as water rights. Um, another unique thing we have, it's a pretty junior water right, but um, we also have protection from the, I think it's the Redlands Mesa Power Plant in the Colorado that keeps a lot of non-consumptive base flow in the Colorado River flowing um, that is likely to prevent a call that would come into Ridgeway Reservoir it's deep enough to it potentially impact our water pool out there. So um, dry year, uh, we watch it literally daily, um, but uh, feeling okay 
and so are the other uh, water managers in the area uh, that um, you know we're always looking to you know if we have a lot of this back to back to back it would could impact things with going to like water restrictions or something but right now all indications are uh, we're going to be okay this year and, and in the foreseeable future. Uh, my question um, involves bike lanes and um, you know like around the rec center you go through bridges to Ogden. That Ogden road is so dangerous to ride your bike to the rec center and <coughs> that's my own little experience but um, in general I feel like you made some really good bike lanes going through the park areas, but to get there is still difficult. Yeah, certainly Ogden is one of our biggest challenges, I think. So that if you got a microscope, I might even need a microscope. Um, I think we have that one about 11 and a half million uh, to get Ogden to where we need it, but as far as bike lanes and widening. A lot of the challenges in Ogden are um, we don't own a lot of the right of ways. So you know, seven or eight different property acquisitions that would be required. We're hoping there's some development that's kind of eyeing this area. That's what's helped a lot of these other areas as development comes in, they have to dedicate the right of way and improve their frontage. It gives the city a jump start that we come and come in and then kind of fill in the gaps. Um, <coughs> our, we do, I guess these days, three to five million in capital a year. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, we don't really go into debt for these things. For the most part, we don't have really any debt. Um, we have some, but not, not much. Um, you know, so this one, it's going to take a while to save for to, to get done. And hopefully something will happen out here. Development usually becomes a catalyst to help kind of jumpstart these types of projects. Um, uh, so unfortunately, there's no good solution right now, um, but it is on the radar. And I agree. <laughs> I'd like to that. You mentioned the one uh, pump that you have is down on East Oak Road. Uh, that's where my water comes from. And you talk about getting rid of that pump and, and putting it back on gravity. So what makes Oak, what the driver for the Oak Grove pump station, uh, so let's see, here's Oak Grove. So um, you have the pump station right here. You know, most of this area is supplemented by the pump. Um, you see, I see some somewhat drastic you know, variation in water pressure because of the way those pumps kick on. It's really driven by the top of the hill up here. So these houses, even if the system was fully built out, would still be deficient on pressure because it's just so high. Um, but one product we do have, so, um, you know, as demand increases, our tanks are up here. And so the ability to fill those, the treatment plant is up here. So the ability to fill those gets more and more challenging as demands are so high and, you know, drought People are water, having to water their lawns more. Um, unfortunately, it makes it hard to keep these tanks full and recovered because um, you know they drop down and then demand stay high and they can't fill back up. And so we actually have, as part of our water master plan, a project we've worked the last couple of years to upsize all the distribution down to here. Um, we have a pretty substantial, about a $5 million product to continue a 24 inch dedicated fill line down to the East Oak Grove pump station. And that will help the pumping there. So the pumping, a lot because you have a lot less friction losses getting to that point so you'll have higher pressure to begin with will help um, reduce the pumping needs there so they'll still they'll probably always be needed but in that case they won't be as needed you know they're only supplementing you know, the last 15 psi or so but the other water system goes right by our, our property and, and it has plenty of pressure on it tri county tri county yeah so a lot of tri county system is is on pumps throughout <coughs> because they have such varied topography throughout their system um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, we meet the, I, I live on that same system um, and uh, uh, it'll be improved, but that pump system will always be good. Scott? Okay. Uh, my concern is the uh, finessing of projects. It seems to me that Montrose, you don't quite finish your project. I'll give you two examples. One is the river bottom drive why don't you finish the <coughs> feet into the parking lot that is a mess? By the lake, the stumps that junk on the right-hand side, that, that's one item. And on the underpass you made for the bike trail, maybe it's out of your control, but the rest of the city, why can't they get rid of that god-awful Quonset hut and junkyard on the west side of the river? <laughs> yeah. We tried to get rid of that junkyard. We did not get on it. So yeah, we actually worked on that in, in 19. We were trying to get some acquisitions from that uh, property owner and those um, 
private property, we can infringe on their rights. It's, um, you know, that, that one's a challenge in itself. And we tried, um, but we uh, did not get anywhere with that. Uh, as far as the uh, river bottom drive, so that project stopped. Uh, I can go back to the picture here. Uh, there was there was method to that madness. Um, that project stopped right you know right here right before you enter into the ponds. Two reasons. Um, there's a pretty mature tree row right along the pond there um, that would have had to have come out in order to uh, extend that project. Or three reasons, I guess, to extend that project. Um, the second piece was the grant funding. So. Um, we were, wanted to make a project that had a really great impact and facilitated this grant here, but kind of ran out of funds to go beyond it. Um, but the third is there also is a master plan being worked on for a complete reconstruction of River Bottom Park, which includes a complete redo of the parking lot and how it's circulating and moving various assets around. And so we didn't want to put in something uh, just to wipe it out. Um, and so we were going to live with the narrower road through there in the interim. Um, and, you know, any widening in there would have required taking those trees out by the time we get to, you know, they're getting mature enough in age, may kind of take care of itself so that we're not taking out things that are, people are pretty attached to um, if we don't have to. So I'm relatively new to Montrose, and the one thing I keep hearing is that kind of the western slope in general, we're in a pretty decent long-running drought. Um, I wanted to know how the lack of moisture that we're getting over the winter is affecting our prospects, and since you're the water guy, um, how is the drought affecting the prospects of being, the city being able to sustain, from a water perspective, a growing population, if that makes any sense? Like, I mean, how is, how is it affecting, like, are we, like, you mentioned that you're, you know, we probably have enough water to last us, you know, for a 60,000 plus population, but you said it was, you know, probably less than that. So I'm wondering, if this drought continues, is that only going to get worse from here? Possible, yeah. And so the first step in that, so we our water resources to be managed by our former city attorney. Um, so the first step on that is is we're working on a comprehensive revisit of all of our water resources and demands and projections uh, to modernize those from those previous numbers because the world has changed and water use has changed and aridification, um, climate change, whatever you want to call it, is here to you know as far as the modeling goes, looks like it's here to stay. So. That's a very real, I want to say threat, but challenge that we need to make sure we're staying ahead of. Um, the idea is to find that steady state throttle, you know, um, I want to say throttle is maybe not necessarily the word, but sustainable um, quality of life thing. And, you know, I, there is a magic question. So there is the ability to expand water resources um, to some degree. Um, those things take a lot of time, 10 to 15 years. And that's why we're looking at a lot of those planning efforts now to try and stay ahead of that so we don't hit the end of our road. Um, there is a magic question, and this is a problem facing the entire Colorado Basin. So, you know, Lake Powell projects would be at 25% and hit 35.5 versus that critical kind of crisis level next March. I mean, that's the larger parent issue on the Colorado River and regionally that we're very much a part of. Um, and those are very tough questions that they're working out the answers to. And that, I don't know, you know, does water limit growth? You know, it's a, you know, we're seeing that in Arizona, we're seeing that in California. Is that going to occur here we'll see <laughs> um it's kind of a crystal ball question that knock on wood <laughs> yeah yeah i mean they say water flows uphill towards money and right. it's an unfortunate reality in the water resources world so it's very much a thing we're trying to stay ahead of and understand what that future is going to look like you know for now there's we're not worried you know we feel like we have what we need but we do need to establish and i think even probably as it goes into the comprehensive plan um the state's even talking about mandates of this that you start including these elements to pace yourself to that eventual kind of end road 40 years out what that is whether that's you know we may water may become a limiting thing on population in the west overall not just Montrose you know so those are big big issues that the west is dealing with right now um, and we're, we're definitely a part of it but we are working on it um, and we have a, an entire program scheduled to just discuss water in Montrose um, so that's coming up next month. Okay. So if you come, you, you'll learn a lot. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we